Architecture, sculpture, painting, even the landscape, create a vision of a perfect place, a place of fantasy and myth where gods might walk with men. Somewhere, of course, which has never existed in history, it is imagined, yet it has been created out of fragments of the half-dreamt, half-remembered ancient Greece and Rome. The poet Shelley wrote at the beginning of the 19th century, we are all Greeks. Our laws, our literature, our religion, our arts, all have their roots in Greece. But for Greece, we might still have been savages and idolaters. The human form and the human mind attained to a perfection in Greece, which has impressed its image on those faultless productions, whose very fragments are the despair of modern art, and which can never cease to delight mankind until the extinction of the race. In the 18th and 19th centuries, Europeans surrounded themselves with the images of Greece and Rome. They created for themselves personal museums which displayed their wealth, taste and learning and idealized the virtues of reason, liberty and justice. In this way, they elevated and even masked their mundane relationships with land ownership and manufacture, trade and empire and they exported these ideals and the visual language which expressed them all over the world to the Americas, the Indies and beyond. It is appropriate then that these are the first pictures we see in a series on the tradition of Western art. We could have started in the caves of Lascaux or the temples of Luxor, but if there is a beginning, a source to which Western art and thought constantly refers, it is in ancient Greece and Rome. A Greece and Rome that are forever fantasized and idealized, but which are with us wherever we look. More than 200 years ago, when the founding fathers of the United States were building their new capital here in Washington, they searched for a visual style which would embody their democratic ideals. And they found it in Greece and Rome, in a style which for them, as still for us, embodies harmony, order, and freedom. And from that day to this, the West has built its temples to liberty and justice and to money and power in the Greek and Roman style. You can see it in Trafalgar Square in London and in Leningrad in the Soviet Union at the root of the Western tradition, in architecture, in painting and in sculpture, is the classical legacy. It's so ingrained in our way of seeing things that most of the time we don't notice when we use it in TV, in commercials, in magazines, in the coins in our pocket, even in a classical head on our credit card. And many of the uses to which we put it, no doubt, would astonish people from the ancient world. But if an ancient Greek could time travel down to our time and be here now, he would recognize this around us. He would surely feel that in some sense, the West is heir to his civilization. The power of this tradition and its hold over our imagination make it difficult for us to see the Greeks and Romans as they really were. The Athenians of the 5th century BC, the builders of the temple at Sunion, are often portrayed as superheroes, the creators of democracy and a perfect society. We must be careful, though, not to idealize them. Like all societies, theirs was imperfect. It was based on slavery. Women had no rights. They were imperialists. And in their darkest moments, as in the bitter Peloponnesian war with Sparta, the Athenians fell prey to irrationality, mass hysteria, strange religious cults, pornography, urban violence, and murderous and unjust acts of foreign policy against smaller states. Things we're all too familiar with in the modern West. But Greek artists and poets understood these things about human nature, and they made their art about those contradictions, about the tragedies and the failures, as well as the achievements. The sculptures of the altar of Zeus from Pergamon portray those contradictions in the dramatic manner of the 2nd century BC. 
but like so much Greek art, the originals have been dismembered and fragmented, scattered around the museums of the world or buried deep and forgotten. Some works are wonderfully preserved on the site of their origin, but most have been broken and bleached by time. It takes imagination and study to piece together these fragments and try to see them again in the context of the society in which they were produced. Who made these images and objects? For whom and why? What was in the artist's mind and in the patron's? And how were they seen by the surrounding society? We shall be helped in answering these questions by art historians like John Boardman of the Ashmolean Museum, Oxford. This is the way we're used to looking at Greek art in museums. In this case, in a cast gallery in the University of Cambridge, where they've assembled these rather gaunt white figures, plaster casts of the more important Greek and Roman statues, which are present in many different museums in the world. Now, the job of the art historian and archaeologist is to try to work out what the original settings for these figures were, what was in the mind of the artist when he made them the way he did, and what the impact would have been on the society for which they were made. There are a number of examples here which make the point rather easily of the difficulty that we have in trying to make this adjustment. This little figure, for instance, which was probably made in Crete in about the middle of the 7th century BC, isn't all that unlike figures which might have been made in a number of other cultures in antiquity, in Assyria or Egypt. At least only an expert would know the difference. It's not distinctively and obviously Greek. There's another problem about it too, which we have to adjust for. There were traces of color on it, and in this museum, a duplicate cast has been colored up with what they think to be more or less the colors of its original appearance, and you can see it's really quite a striking difference to the way in which we are used to seeing figures of this sort. If we move on about 100 years to another figure, and one of the important characteristics of Greek art is the extremely rapid development of style, we find something which is considerably more realistic, still very formal, rather stiff, but quite unmistakably Greek. And this figure too can tell us a little bit more about her original appearance because she was found with traces of color on her dress and on her face. And again, a duplicate cast here has been restored and painted up to give us an idea of what she looked like in antiquity. The colors would probably have been muted somewhat by the bright Athenian sun. But what we've got to do is to try to make these adjustments to allow for these figures in their original setting, their original appearance, try to understand their original function. Because if we can't do this, we can't understand what Greek art's really about. The art we recognize as Greek was produced in the millennium between two and three thousand years ago. The temple at Sunion was built in the great classical period of Athenian triumph, but centuries before, Greek society was already recognizably different from the other cultures of the ancient Near East. Persia and Egypt were mighty empires ruled by dynasties that gave themselves the status of gods. The Greeks lived in small city-states under the rule of petty kings. The scale of these small Greek communities, clinging to a rocky landscape, never far from the sea, made them vulnerable to attack from larger forces, but also threw them back on their resources of fitness, strength, intelligence, calculation, and above all, individual heroism. The idea of the individual standing proudly independent is one of the most powerful and resilient ideas in human history. The figure of the Kouros shows this idea taking the center of the stage. The single figure of the Kouros strides forward. He supports himself. He does not need the back pillar, which would have supported an Egyptian statue of the same period. The Kouros represents an idealized young man, aged between 18 and 20, at the peak of physical powers. He would have stood on the grave of a man of any age, or have been offered to the gods, most especially to Apollo, the epitome of the youthful ideal projected onto the heavens. 
The male figure, naked, proud, idealized, did have a female equivalent in the Kore. She too is beautiful, but she is serene rather than heroic. She's clothed and static, not boldly striding forward like the male. The turn of the 6th century to the 5th century BC saw one of the most dramatic transitions in history, political and social. It coincided with an equally dramatic transition in art. The Critian boy of the early 5th century BC is the Kouros come to life. He has relaxed his body and come closer to the appearance of nature. We can only speculate about and imagine the relationship between the development of democracy in the Greek city-states and the development of an unprecedented realism in art. But both, in their quite separate ways, reveal a new excitement in the idea that individual human beings can take charge of their own destiny, even though they do so under the capricious gaze of man-like gods. The Zeus, recovered from the wreck of Artemisium, shows the new freedom and confidence of sculptors modeling clay rather than carving stone and translating the clay model by casting it in bronze. The Zeus describes his power by reaching his hand far out over his realm, brandishing his thunderbolt, gazing unwaveringly towards the horizon. He stands like an icon of divine power, Zeus is depicted as king of the universe. He's shown as a supremely poised being far above the hubbub and turmoil of man's life on earth. The fact that his physique is no different from that of an athlete or a hero is simply a continuation of the Greek idea that the gods were made in human form. The triumph of democracy, a more restricted matter than the mass democracies of today, but nevertheless a dramatic change from tyranny, coincided with the triumph of the Athens of Pericles. Pericles was not a tyrant, but a leader chosen by the Athenian citizens as their representative. He led Athens through a period of reconstruction after the wars with the Persians, wars which had left Athens in ruins, but finally rid of its great enemy and at the head of a league of Greek city-states. The mid-5th century BC was the period of Athens' greatest influence, not only on the Greek world at that time, but on subsequent history. The most impressive and evocative monument to that influence is the Acropolis, the citadel which still dominates Athens. Pericles used the resources, or some contemporaries argued abused them, to rebuild the Acropolis and crown it with the Parthenon. The bold simplicity of the building, with its strictly harmonized repetition of the most basic geometric shapes, has had an unparalleled influence on the architecture of the world. The creators of the Parthenon, including the sculptor Phidias and the architect Ictinos, adapted the traditional temple form but refined it. They created an impression of subtlety and lightness, despite the scale of the building and the massiveness of its marble surface. The sculptural decorations employed the skills of hundreds of craftsmen and set a new standard in art. It took less than a decade to erect this monument to Athenian pride. It was built on the ruins of a temple destroyed by the Persians and in part glorified the victory of the Greeks over their greatest enemy. But to their subsequent cost, the Athenians took more than their share of the benefits of Persian defeat. At home, they may have been democratic, but to their fellow Greeks, such as the Corinthians and Spartans, they appeared arrogant and domineering. They felt that the protection of their founding goddess, Athena, had given them a special status. This special relationship was celebrated in a procession to honor the goddess. 
Today, the Parthenon is most admired for the exquisite harmony of its architecture and for the refinement of its friezes. But to the ancient Athenians, it was admired for something rather different, what lay inside the temple. And that was a statue of Athena nearly 40 feet high. That's only five feet below the ceiling as we look at it today. A statue armed, covered with gold, in all its dress from head to foot, the skin ivory with monsters on its helmet and a great serpent by its side. To us, that would seem garish, grandiose and unrestrained. But that was the core of the building. And if you put yourself in the position of uh, an ancient Athenian, perhaps coming from the Panathenaic procession, in the broad daylight, the blue skies and dazzling light of an Attic August, and then going inside that building, we can imagine what it felt like to see that statue as the eyes became accustomed to the gloom and saw the glitter of the gold, the jeweled eyes reflected in the pool below the statue. The effect must have been overwhelming. We can only imagine the impact created by the goddess and her surroundings. Our attempts to reconstruct the statue's appearance, like this one from the 19th century, can merely hint at the experience of seeing it in its dramatic context. But it does remind us how vivid, how colourful Greek art must have been in classical times. Bleached by the centuries and sterilised by the surroundings of the museum, the reliefs of the Parthenon frieze appear cool and restrained. But originally they would have been brightly coloured and even more lifelike than they are now. Their depiction of the Panathenaic procession would have been still more convincing. Art and nature coming closer together than ever before. The frieze is generally regarded as representing the high point in the classical style. Composition is still rather formal, almost mechanical, but it's enlivened by a great many realistic details of gesture and posture. Figures are perhaps rather unemotional, but highly idealized. The whole thing seems to represent a, a balance between that Greek preoccupation with composition, proportion, and a growing sense of realism. The illusion of reality is created even more impressively in the massive sculptures of the pediments, the gables at each end of the building. What seems to happen is that they were creating, so far as they could, more successful images of man by varying the representation of details. There was, as it were, a sort of natural selection of forms and the forms that were eventually adopted naturally tended to be the more realistic ones. Add to it, remember, the colouring of the hair and the eyes, which would add to this realistic effect. And as soon as they succeeded in understanding how the human figure worked, that it was not simply an assemblage of patterns and volumes, they moved very rapidly to the point at which they could create a human figure in two dimensions or in three dimensions, which realistically portrayed quite subtle poses, postures and actions. This was the major breakthrough. This is the thing which marked out Greek art from that of all contemporary cultures. This, at least in sculpture, was the point at which Greek art took off in a totally new direction and informed the whole Western tradition. In the next century, sculptors would project the youthful ideas of the Kouros and the Parthenon frieze onto a living man, Alexander the Great. Alexander the Macedonian was a very different man from Pericles the Athenian, no longer the leader as democratic representative, but the leader as godlike hero. Alexander fought to build an empire which covered two million square miles from Greece to India. Although he died in his early thirties, Alexander's model of Greek civilization lasted for centuries. Greek cities flourished far from Greece itself. The city of Pergamon, sited in what is now Turkey, exemplifies this post-imperial Greece. The Pergamenes created an art which was expressive and highly dramatized, in contrast with the measure and restraint of their Athenian predecessors. 
The altar of Zeus, built in the second century BC, is clearly inspired by the Parthenon, but it depicts the struggle between implacable gods and tormented giants with unprecedented vividness. The artists display their confidence and skill with a bravura that will not be seen again until the 16th century. The artist seems to be celebrating his own technique so that you can feel the chisel cutting into the stone or the rasp making an immense range of surface textures. The battle between the forces of the rational and irrational becomes the opportunity for the artist to express his unique abilities. The great altar of Pergamon is one of the most impressive and characteristic monuments from ancient Greek culture. And yet, at the time it was finished, about 170 BC, the age of these independent Greek city-states and kingdoms like Pergamon was nearing its end, as a new power pushed its order across the Mediterranean, Rome. The Romans conquered Greece in the middle of the second century BC. They would surpass the Greeks in political power, in military might, in technological innovation. But the Romans would be forever in Greece's debt in the fields of philosophy, science, literature, and the arts. As the Roman poet said, captive Greece made Rome captive. The visual language devised by the Greeks would be adopted by the Romans and subsequently by the entire Western tradition. Indeed, it would become the preeminent means of portraying order, rationality, harmony, and power, whether in dictatorships, despotisms, or democracies. Ironically, though, the lesson which the Greeks understood and which their artists expressed in great works like this and in the Parthenon sculptures namely that the disruptive and frightening forces of the irrational will always threaten to burst out in human history. That lesson would have to be learned again and again. A few hundred yards from the Pergamon Museum in East Berlin is a telling reminder of those forces which can lead cultures to tear themselves apart or to subjugate others in the name of empire, race, nation, glory. Here, an exquisite Greek temple built in the early 19th century as a guardhouse for the Prussian army is now a monument to the victims of fascism. And this in the city which led the modern revival of the classical legacy. The style of the Greeks and their inheritors has been used to stand for harmony and order, and yet at the same time to legitimize violence and absolute power. It is the face of enlightenment and of empire. The story of Western art then is complex and rich in irony, an art which has served lofty spiritual ideals and grossly material ones, which has expressed the politics of closed societies and the workings of the free individual conscience. The themes bequeathed us by the Greeks can be followed over 2,000 years open to outside influences, changes of direction and style, but despite many turnings, still the same common stream, which is the West's way of seeing.